what I'd like to, to do uh, this evening is discuss with you a bit about what is humanitarianism. The word gets bandied around and people call themselves humanitarians. Uh, and then talk you through, from my experiences, how best we can help. People do want to help. There's an enormous amount of goodwill when terrible events occur. There's an outpouring uh, of offers of help, but it's not always helpful. And uh, so <clears throat> I did think of, say, of giving my talk and just saying, how can we best help those in need during and after a humanitarian crisis and just say, give money? <laughs> now, the reaction to that is, well, no, no, I want to give of myself. I want to do something more tangible, all of which is laudable. But unless you have specialist skills uh, that are in short supply and are being asked for, you add another problem to what is already very problematic. Then you might say, well, you don't know where the money goes. Well, I can tell you from my experience, if you just send things, that's very unlikely you will know exactly where they go. I'm afraid that's been my experience. You may have exceptions. You may be able to say, I know exactly where it goes. But in general, you don't know where it goes. If you give money and you give it to uh, the Disasters Emergency Committee or a big, well-known uh, charity, then it is really guaranteed that it will go where it's intended to go. So thank you for listening to me. I'll now take any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Humanitarianism. I'll just give you a bit of a background to it. It all dates back really to the foundation of the Red Cross. And this book, A Memory of Solferino, written by Henri Dunant, a Swiss national, when he was in northern Italy and this battle was going on, and he saw all the wounded just left to suffer and die, and he thought it was outrageous. And so on returning to Geneva, he set up the International Committee of the Red Cross. By the way, if you go on the Red Cross website, you can download that book in English. It's still, still in print and it's free and it's well worth reading because you will actually see where the modern humanitarian movement has come from. And it was only a year later that the first Geneva Convention was agreed. There were further developments of it and there were the Hague Conventions, but the first convention was for the protection of the wounded in battle. They call it hors de combat, that once you are wounded, no matter what side you're on, you are out of the battle and you are to be treated as neutral. You don't always see that. And when I've been working in conflicts and tried to treat the wounded, it gets very difficult because uh, people who've been harmed by the other side really find it difficult to see you treat the enemy who may have killed their family. But once they're wounded, the Geneva Convention says they're out of the battle and they require humanitarian assistance. There were then other conventions. People talk about the Geneva Convention, but there are conventions and additional protocols. But these came after the Second World War. And you've got the second convention, which is that sailors deserve the same treatment in combat uh, as do uh, the land armies. Pr the treatment of prisoners of war in the third, and then also civilians caught up in conflicts. Very relevant, as we see in today's world. And all these come together in the concept of international humanitarian law, which you, I would advise you, oh, well, I would recommend that you, you look it up and see what it actually entails, what it demands of us. And you will also appreciate the difficulties in enforcing it. And these combine also in the humanitarian principles. And this is what any humanitarian organization must adhere to. You must, must recognize humanity, which is you will relieve suffering wherever you find it. That's what the humanitarians 
uh, the humanitarian principles demand of us. And you will relieve that suffering, you will help those affected by being neutral, you don't take sides, you'll be impartial, whatever the, the background to the conflict is, you are impartial, and that you are independent. And it gets difficult during a conflict where very bad things are being done to maintain all those principles. But if you don't, you might still be hoping to do good, but it then becomes questionable whether what you're doing is truly humanitarian. And just by way of an example with, with independence, who is funding you? You will find that many NGOs uh, that have difficulty sometimes in they seek funding, but you've got to make that funding, that external funding, independent of what you want to do. So yes, the missions that people run are extremely expensive, and you will be funded by governments, by the European Union, by, uh, by major donors, but for which we are very grateful. But the actual delivery of the aid has got to be independent of all that. But you will, just in the parlance, humanitarian aid is often used just to distinguish it from long-term development aid, so it's emergency aid. Even when humanitarianism was established in the mid-19th century, the biggest opponent was Florence Nightingale. This is what she said about the Red Cross, that uh, an organisation like the Red Cross alleviated the responsibilities of the warring governments by providing aid on humanitarian grounds on a voluntary basis and funded by charity, it would actually make it easier for armies to carry on killing one another. She basically said, let them get on with it. We're not going to clear up the mess. Now, that is, that is very stark utilitarianism. It's not humanitarian. And there are, these arguments continue to this day. I really admire Florence Nightingale. She was actually a very wonderful statistician. But I don't agree with her on this. And my first recommendation as to how to help people is respect the humanitarian charter. That is, everybody has the right to life with dignity. Everybody. No matter what, everybody has the right to receive humanitarian assistance, has the right to receive it, and the right to protection and security. That is the fundamental right. Implementing it can be very difficult, but that is our, all of us, that is our right. Okay, a bit about me. How did I get in, into all this? Well, my background is in emergency medicine. I uh, was always drawn to doing things in medicine that were really quite straightforward to do and had an immediate and tangible effect rather than more... Uh, more prolonged input, inputs. Um, Dr. Tedros, who's the head of WHO, expressed this rather well, actually, that no one should die for the lack of access to emergency care. That we have simple, affordable, and provable interventions that save lives. We do. And not everyone and everywhere has them, but it's really quite straightforward. So in delivering an aid to people, in helping people, keep it simple make it effective. Many simple things are very effective. But we also have to measure and evaluate what you do. And, and that's why, alongside setting up an NGO that would deliver the aid, I also helped set up a re research and teaching unit that would look at what we do and analyze it and say whether or not, in fact, we are doing any good. We always think we're doing it, but are we? We've got to measure the outcome, which can be difficult. And so I went into emergency medicine, or accident in emergency medicine, it was then called. This is Sir Harry Platt, who was an orthopaedic surgeon at Ancoats Hospital. He had many innovations. Uh, he actually invented the concept of a fracture clinic, that people with fractures would be seen in a separate clinic. Every hospital in the world has a fracture clinic. It started in Ancoats Hospital by Sir Harry Platt, but he produced a report in the 1960s 
where he recommended that casualty departments should change their name to accident and emergency departments. This is in the 1960s. Something the BBC has still to grasp. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm very patient, but it's taking them quite a bit of time. But he came up with accident emergency, and they should have specialist uh, consultants uh, who, who work in them, rather than anybody just managing it. And so I worked for Professor Sir Miles Irving, who was Professor of Surgery, but he set up an academic department of accident and emergency medicine, the first in the country, and I was the first lecturer. <laughs> 